AIM training is one of the leading causes of wrist pain for gamers, and it could be the reason why you aren't making progress with training, or you might have missed clicks, your flicks haven't been as accurate, even if you don't have pain. In this year alone, about 37% of the pros we've worked with developed wrist pain as a result of starting an AIM training program. So today, my mission is to help you understand how you can approach AIM training safely, whether it be working with a coach, a program, or self-directed. For those that don't know, I'm a physical therapist who has been in gaming and esports for the past eight years. I worked with Manny OW, the GOAT himself, and we're partnered with the Voltaic community to keep everyone in that Discord and overall community healthy. Aim training is an efficient method to improve your aim, and there are so many great content pieces out there about how to begin the process of aim training. Yet, none of them really discuss the risk of developing wrist pain and how you can safely improve your aim. It can be one of the reasons you hit a plateau or even notice your aim slowly worsening over time. How we control our input device, what sensitivity, mouse pad, and grip that we utilize all impact what muscles we use. And this can be quite an in-depth discussion. So for this video, I'll focus on the grip, aim training specific approaches, and techniques that might impact the muscles that we use. For example, scenario selection or the skill you're trying to train can also impact the muscles we use as we may want to preferentially train wrist aim, micro corrections, or arm control with certain tracking scenarios. And if you want to learn more about mouse ergonomics and some of the other factors, check out some of the gaming ergonomic videos that I've made in my playlist right over here. So let's review some of the basic grips and what muscles they prioritize. This grip uses an even distribution of flexor muscles, your FDS, FTP, and lumbricals, and is typically less stressful on the muscles that flick left and right too, as there is less a downward pressure. This grip is not commonly utilized in aim training since it provides for less overall control, and there is a slight biomechanical disadvantage for utilizing a palm grip with click timing, especially since there is a slightly larger moment arm, which means it's difficult to repeatedly click. Claw grip provides more overall control with increased tension, it's easier to click, it has a very slight biomechanical advantage, and it just gives the user better overall control of clicking. And it typically increases the use of your wrist and finger flexors, your FTS and FTP, because of passive insufficiency of your lumbricals. And it also leads to increased use of the muscles on the top side of the forearm, your extensors. This is the most commonly utilized grip in aim training due to its overall control with that palmar contact, and the palmar pressure impacts how much the radial and ulnar deviators are used. There are a lot of reasons why it is the most commonly utilized in aim training, but it's likely associated with the increased perception of control. How your ring and pinky contact the mouse also impact which muscles are utilized, whether it be fingertip contact or lateral contact of the ring and pinky finger. And of course, lastly, there's fingertip grip, which allows for increased degree of control, yet increases the utilization of some of these smaller muscles of the hand. And I believe this is less commonly utilized as tracking scenarios are extremely difficult with a fingertip grip, as you have to maintain an isometric contraction of the grip muscles as you move your wrist. But as we all know, there are definitely some unique grips found with gaming, and I'll review some of the more unique ones I've seen specific to aim training. Starting with Manny, he has a pretty standard claw grip with these stabilizing fingers, his thumb, pinky, and ring closer to the optical sensor. And that likely gives him a bit more perception of control. Uh, the lateral aspect of his ring and pinky finger also contact the mouse, which means he's using that palmar interossei or the smaller muscles of the hand to stabilize the outside of the mouse. If we look at Cartoon, he also has a claw grip, and I'll show the side view in a little bit, but he has an ulnarly deviated position of his wrist, and he maintains this during his entire aiming session, which can lead to overuse of the pinky-sided muscles, and that depends on how much downward pressure he's applying throughout. Cartoon's claw grip also has a bit more extension, which can lead to earlier fatigue of some of those muscles during longer sessions. Looking at Clover, we see another claw and it's definitely more aggressive. Again, more extension compared to Cartoon and fingertip contact for that ring pinky finger. So overall using more of the finger flexors. And again, because he does have that more aggressive claw for his index and middle finger, he's using his extensors or the top side of his forearm there. So this is an example of not a claw grip and it's unique because his thumb is in a shortened position which can increase the use of those muscles and his mouse is really far away from his wrist joint which can actually lead to increased use of those finger and wrist extensors, so the top side of the forearm and hand. Grips is one thing, but also understanding the fundamental movements that occur within aiming can help us better identify what joints and muscles we are using. And if we use first principles and evaluate aim movements, here is what we find. 
We have small angle flicks which are utilized commonly with micro corrections. These are the muscles we utilize when we flick to the left and we flick to the right. Take note of the difference in musculature which is also why we tend to notice pinky sided discomfort with aim training. Then we have middle angle flicks which utilize the shoulder wrist and a little bit of the elbow. Here you can see some of the muscles when we use the shoulder and we move and flick to the left and the muscles that we're utilizing when we're flicking to the right. For the wrist, it's the same muscles that I described before. Of course, we have a larger angle flicks which are primarily dominated by the larger shoulder muscles. So the pec, lat, teres major, those are the muscles utilized. And then we have the tracking movements. For the shorter strafe tracks, it is similar to small angle flicks. However, a different contraction profile is it's a bit more controlled, meaning a slightly higher contraction. For the mid and longer strafes, it really depends on the movement strategy the individual likes to take, as it may vary based on your settings. Based on the scenario you choose, target spacing, and what techniques you want to employ to score will all utilize these movements and can then impact how much certain muscle groups are being used. And this assumes the more standard posture in which the arm is not abducted, because that posture will actually change the preferential joints or movement that you will want to utilize. Okay, so because aim training is often higher APMs and with higher overall intensity, when compared to the competitive games that we play, kind of like how Deathmatch for Valorant is slightly higher intensity since there are more player interactions and aim situations, it increases the risk that we will irritate the tendons at our wrists. And we need to be able to have the endurance and the muscles we use to handle the stress without irritating our tissues. And as a reminder to everyone, poor endurance of the muscles we utilize or an excessive aim training schedule is what typically leads to most injuries. And the health bar is the best way to understand this. I talk about this concept all the time, but think of your muscles as only being able to handle so much, your HP. So depending on your own circumstances, physical activity, you might only be able to tolerate 30 minutes of aim training after your full day of work or school. And if you follow a program blindly 60 minutes on a daily basis that is higher in intensity, like micro corrections, meaning we lose more HP per click, then you also put yourself at risk. And this is exactly what happened with one of the pro Valorant players we had worked with. So when our tendons become irritated, we may or may not have some wrist pain. Some of it may manifest as stiffness, but your scores may be impacted or you might notice you have trouble flicking to one side. At a basic level, this happens because the communication between the brain and the tendon gets altered, often being inhibited or overstimulated, affecting our muscle activation patterns. When this connection is altered, we might contract too quickly, leading to overshooting, hypermetria, or we might not be able to use all of our fibers, inhibition, leading to hypometria. So for example, in the most common pain pattern with aim trainers, which is pinky sided wrist pain, the muscle responsible for flicking to the right and maintaining downward pressure may not work well, yet the other muscle responsible for flicking might be too strong, causing you to overshoot. And if you already have an issue, exercise can help to restore your control and prevent the injuries from returning. And remember, you can check out our free wrist pain guides here if you want specific exercises to restore your control and aim. The two most common pain patterns that we see specific to aim training are palm-sided wrist pain and pinky-sided wrist pain. We see the palm-sided wrist pain due to the overall increased use of the flexors and the higher APMs, and then just the higher tension grip that typically occurs when you're performing the scenarios, especially near the end of scenarios. And then for pinky-sided wrist pain, I mentioned this in my other video, but due to the distribution of muscle fibers, it leads to the increased likelihood of the palm-sided ulnar deviator to get fatigued more quickly. And there's only two muscles involved in flicking to the right. And we can prevent these injuries from happening by following the steps in the next chapter. So step one is build up your health bar, or you can think of it like HP maxing, or regularly incorporating some wrist and hand conditioning exercises to ensure you have more overall endurance to handle your aim training program. If you have 10K HP, it doesn't matter if your aim training takes 2K, you have the capacity to handle it. And understanding the biomechanics as we discussed helps us identify which exercises we can perform. I have two general routines I would recommend, which I'll link in the description. And they target all of the most commonly used muscles at the wrist and hand, but also consider doing a posture routine two times a week to ensure you target some of the shoulder muscles as they have connections down into the connect chain and can influence how quickly these fatigue based on your shoulder position. And this will give you a good base, but 
you also have to manage your health bar. And this means starting slow and being smart about how you leverage the programs and scenarios you might find online. Most times, beginners will load up basic programs and follow them blindly without thinking about how to practically perform all of the scenarios. And we'll take some of the Voltaic fundamental routines as an example. If anyone just picked up this and performed all in one single hour and did it every single day, they would be at the highest risk of injury. But you can actually break it down into blocks to be performed throughout the day. How long you consecutively aim train is the dial of aggressiveness you want to take with the aim training approach. All 65 minutes is the most aggressive, but breaking it into two 30 minute blocks is a safe approach and four 15 minute blocks is more conservative. So you can start slow and gradually work up based on how you feel. And remember, you can use things like stretches, self massage to manage or restore some of that HP between scenarios or after a certain amount of runs. But how do you know how much you can start with? You can listen to your own body, which is step number three. If you decide to train 65 minutes every day, then you need to see how your wrist and hand responds to that. Most often, some stiffness at the wrist will be an initial symptom or even a slight change in control. If you feel more stiff in the next morning, assuming everything else in your schedule stayed the same, and we can assume aim training was the main load for the muscles, then you know what you did before may have been too much. So you need to modify appropriately. And that means maybe reducing it to 60, 70% of what you did the day before. If you're tired of looking up random videos to try to find a better solution for your wrist pain, I want to actually direct you to a new product we launched called the AI Wrist Health Wizard. It's one of the best things that we've ever made and we've made it as easy as possible for you to fix your wrist pain. All you have to do is load up the tool, run through the assessment, and in less than 15 minutes, you'll get a program that's customized specific to you. And if you want to learn more, please check it out in the link in the description.